So that chapter may be a little bit of a red herring about what this, uh, this sermon's about, um, though it does tie in quite a bit actually about how Jesus is of course the king, the last king after the throne of David and um, we'll, get to, we'll get to chapter Jeremiah 33 in the end there. Uh, but today's uh, sermon is something that stood out to me while reading the book of Samuel actually. Um, and it's a theme I've seen through many books of the Old and New Testament. Um, So the title of the sermon is, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. So we're going to be taking that phrase from 1 Samuel 3, if you want to turn there. And we'll start in verse 10. But if you remember the story that uh, Samuel, uh, he's been raised by Eli. You should remember his mother Hannah. Um, She went into the temple and cried unto the Lord and said, you know, I want a son. Um, The Lord answered her prayer, gave her a son Samuel, and part of her vow to God was that she would give that son to the priesthood. So, of course, that's why Samuel is there with Eli, um, to serve the Lord. That was the vow that she made to the Lord. Um, So Samuel's giving bad news to Eli in chapter 3. So we'll look down there at verse 10. In 1 Samuel 3.10, it says, And the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. So we see here judgment is actually coming upon Eli and his sons because his sons were wicked and Eli had not corrected them nor raised them in the ways of the Lord. And there are times where bad things might happen to us or we might read the word and be convicted or hear preaching that will convict us. But it's how we respond to that. Uh, it's how we handle those things that determine like, how we're walking with God and how well we're doing. So Eli could have responded by rebelling against the Lord or choosing to shoot the messenger, so to speak. Um, but we look at, at, at the response. In verse 15, it says, And Samuel lay unto the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. And Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is the thing the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee, and more also, if they hide anything from me, all the things that he has said unto thee. So again, that's the right response. We should always seek the the full word of God, the true word of God, not even fearing what what they're going to say, but, you know, even if it's against you, the word of God is still true, and it's still good for you. I mean, verse 18, and this this is where we get the title of the sermon, said, And Samuel told him every whit, and hid nothing from him, and he said, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. And that's, that's just a very powerful statement. When I read that, that's why it really stuck out to me. And that's why I want to preach this sermon today. Um, because I loved it when I read that. And based on how it's written, you know, it could be read that it was said by Samuel to, to Eli, or as an instruction, or it could have been Eli's response to what he'd heard. Um, but either way, Um, it doesn't really change the statement. It's equally true, regardless of who said it. Um, But I like to think it was Eli's response, because I also do see something similar later, and we'll get to that shortly, where someone else actually makes a very similar statement in regards to the Lord. So I like to give Eli the credit for that statement, and just showing that he handled it correctly uh, when the Lord came to judge him and his family. Because it is the Lord, and let him do what seemeth him good. See, while it's not good for Eli, it's the Lord's will. And that's the thing, even, even though things, you know, it, it was not good necessarily for Eli because he was being judged by God, but it was good for the people. It was good for God and his people. And so God does what God does, and he, he does what he wants. He does what's good for the people and for himself. And that's what we need to understand. Whenever we look at, at when the Lord does something, we need to understand that it's his, you know, he, he knows more than us. He knows things that we don't know. So it may not look right to us, but it's right to him. And we, we also understand we can't fight the Lord and win. There's no way we can fight the Lord and win. Nobody can. So we will look at another example 
if you turn to 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 10. So this is after the death of Saul during the reign of King David. He's already won several battles, but there's another example of putting your trust in the Lord and what he will do. And in this case, they're fighting against the enemies, the, the, enemies, the Ammonites, who had also hired the Syrians to fight with them because they couldn't take on, on David and his armies alone. So in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Then it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. So David's doing a good thing here. He sees that the king's died, a new king's taken over, and he says, well, I liked the old king, we were friends, so let's show kindness unto the new king and just say, hey, let's, let's get along. But you look at the response here from the children of Ammon. It said, And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honour thy father, that he has sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city, to spy it out, and to overthrow it? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants, and shaved off the one half of their beards, and cut off the garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. So David's trying to show kindness, but it was returned as evil towards him, him and his men. And so his servants were humiliated, and that's when David tells them to wait at Jericho until their beards regrow, so that they don't return ashamed to their families. In verse 5, 2 Samuel 10, it says, When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed, and the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards are grown, and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of beth Reob, and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and a king of Maacah, 1,000 men, and of Ishtob, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering in of the gate. And the Syrians of Zobah, and of Rehob, and Ishtob, and Maacah were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose all of the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, I, I will come and help thee. Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God, and the Lord do that which seemeth him good. So we see this response here from Joab. And it looks like a hopeless situation. You know, they're surrounded on either side by the Ammonites and the Syrians, and they went into this thing not knowing what to expect. Um, but they trusted in the Lord to provide a victory. You know, they, they believed the Lord was going to fight with them, you know, because he's fighting in, in defense of this, his people. And they were fighting for God and for his nation. But we see that statement there, the Lord do that which seemeth him good. So no matter what we're doing, we should always be keeping that in our mind. You know, I believe that's a very powerful statement. It's a good way to live your life. Um, it's just, you know, it's the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. Um, so if you want to turn to James chapter 4, we actually see something similar taught in, in the New Testament here in James chapter 4. In James 4.13, it says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanish away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. See, whatever we do, it should be according to God's will. Um, we don't see what's going to happen tomorrow. The Lord knows. He exists outside of time. He's the one who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen today. And so that's why we leave our life in his hands. We don't necessarily, you know, plan to bring up all this wealth. Like you've got that uh, parable of the guy who who builds a storehouse because he said, I'm just going to sit a king and, and just retire on everything that I've had. My storehouse is full, let's, let's knock it down and build a bigger one. 
And, you know, the Lord basically says, you're not going to get to enjoy any of it. You know, I'm going to take it all away. You're going to die before you get to enjoy any of it. Like, we don't know what, what, what it brings. So that's why we're not to be covetous. We're not to seek after riches. Because we could be gone tomorrow. And it, it wouldn't even matter. It would all be vanity. And just a waste, of, complete waste of your time. But the Lord knows all things. And he's, he's the one who guides us with his eyes. So he knows what's going to happen. So that he makes sure that we're in the right place at the right time. Where he wants us for his will, not ours. And he's given us the word to read and he's given us preachers and teachers so that we can know his perfect will. And he's given us the commandments and the statutes to do and keep. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 5. But that's how we should, we should react. Even to bad news or affliction, you know, whether it be suffering or judgment or, or a trial or test from God. See, we let him do what seemeth him good because he's God and he's always right. And, you know, we're not. We don't know. So in Acts chapter 5, verse 1, of course, we all know the story. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So, and that's the sin that condemns him. And at that early point in the church, you know, one, one thing we see God do many times is very early on, he sets an example. He sets an example f from somebody who did the wrong thing and says, now the same will happen to anyone who does likewise. And it's about instilling the fear of the Lord, as we'll see later. In verse 5, it says, An Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. So again, we see it's a pattern. You notice comes up over and over again in the Old and New Testament that God does set an example, you know, so that others will hear and fear. I'll get you to stay, actually, I don't know if we need to stay in Acts 5, do we? Yes, we do. So I'll, you stay in Acts 5. I'll read to you from Deuteronomy some verses about the law, and they give the reasons why the punishments were given by God. So in Deuteronomy 4, verse 10, it says, Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I'll make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So do you mind giving me a tissue, Hayden? So Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 13, 6. If, the bro if thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend which is in thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers. Thanks, brother. Excuse me. Sorry. I'll just repeat uh, the end of verse 6. Which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thy eye pity him, thou sh neither shalt thou spare, ne neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt, be, and thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he hath thought to, to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. So again, we see the reasoning here. It's so that people will hear the word of the Lord and fear him. They'll fear God and they'll keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 20, 21 says, and all, sorry, 21, 21. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put away evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. 
and 2858 Deuteronomy. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God. So you see how seriously the Lord takes it when he says he's to be feared. Like he's not joking around. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge and understanding, but it's also the beginning of salvation. If you don't fear the Lord, you're not going to believe on him to be saved. So it is the beginning of salvation as well. And while our Lord is loving and merciful, he's full of grace and truth, but he's also holy and righteous. You know, and sin must be punished. And of course, Christ paid eternally for our sins on the cross. So that's something we'll never have to pay for. But also, it doesn't mean we continue in sin. You know, the grace may abound because we're chastened in this flesh because sin must be punished. And there are still consequences for sin, you know, and that consequence is not eternity in the lake of fire for us. We're saved from that. But there still are consequences in this flesh. So, of course, we should fear God and we should fear those consequences, fear what God can do to this body as well. But you're there in Acts chapter 5, verse 8. We'll continue on. It said, And Peter, Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And he said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And look at this verse, verse 11. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. So again, we see the reason why God did, God did this, because he needs to set an example of his holiness. And some people might read the story and think, you know, maybe that was a bit harsh, maybe it wasn't necessary. But that's the wrong way to read the story. We need to read the story, you know, with the understanding that it's the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. It's about what he does and, and what he does is always right. So we need to always read it with that in mind. See, when God sets an example, he's doing it for a reason. And he's right to do so. And the issue is they not only lied to the Holy Ghost about a voluntary gift to the church, but they conspired to withhold that money for themselves. See, they could have just sold it and kept it all for themselves. They could have just kept the property. They didn't have to do anything. But the fact that they conspired against the Holy Ghost and lied to him, that's why they were killed. And that's the example the Lord wanted to set. And th th these stories are there not just for the church there to fear, but also for us, who are reading thousands of years later, that we would also fear the Lord. So if you want to turn to Numbers chapter 16... I'll read to you just from Le Le Leviticus chapter 10 about Nadab and Abihu. So in Le Leviticus 10, 1, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. So these two men were destroyed for burning that strange incense before the Lord, as he commanded them not to do. And we see more people in number 16 who defied the Lord and the man of God, and God made an example of them. So we're familiar with the, uh, with the story of uh, Korah and his rebellion. So in number 16, verse 28, it says, And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited by the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then shall ye understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. So that's the thing. Rebellion is as witchcraft, the Bible says. You know, it was a sin punishable unto death. And we see, you know, here that these people were swallowed up into the pit of hell, 
while I was still alive, something that had never been done before or since. But that's the thing, opposing God and his chosen authority can lead to your destruction. That would also include biblically qualified pastors and bishops and deacons. See, if they're qualified according to the scriptures and ordained by God, then they should be respected and honoured, you know, as God's chosen authority over the church because they are our overseer and the Lord has put them in that position. Now I'm not talking about unqualified or disqualified pastors. You know, I don't believe they hold any, any legitimate position. But for those who are biblically ordained, they are the people of God and they are the leaders and authority that God has put over us. And we should respect them. And we see here that when, when these men rebelled against Moses and against God, see, they went straight down into the pit of fire alive. And it's an example to anyone who might think about rebelling against God's authority. See, even when he judged Sodom and Gomorrah and the towns round about, raining down fire and brimstone to utterly destroy them, he was right about that. See, in Jude 1.7 it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. But what's the example? The example is to fear the Lord, that the Lord will utterly destroy you you know, he certainly can. And there, like, it's within his rights to destroy any one of us. It's within his rights to take my life right now. It's within his rights to do whatever he likes because he's the one who created me. You know, I am not my own. Even so, because I'm a son of God, I'm bought with a price. He owns me. He bought me. But we see the parallel passage in Second Peter 4. It says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And a lot of people seem to overlook... Or forget that one time the Lord repented that he'd even made man and he destroyed the entire world, save for Noah and his family. And we see even today that people, according to Second Peter 3, and I hear this from people all the time, but the Bible's always right. Second Peter 3, 3, it says, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So we don't always know why the, Lord's, why the Lord does something, but in some cases there's a clear violation of scripture, a clear violation of a commandment, and God even spells it out. This is why I did this as an example. Um, and sometimes it's also not just a violation of the law. Like we see one case with, uh, with Moses where he destroyed a picture, um, a picture of Christ. So, you know, when Moses, he was forbidden to enter the promised land and that was a punishment for him for rather than speaking to the rock as he was commanded, he smote the rock and water came out. But what that did was it actually destroyed the picture of Jesus Christ, which is supposed to be that rock, where he would speak to the rock and receive the living waters by speaking to the rock. And because of that, he didn't get to enter into the promised land. He got to see it from top of the mountain and died immediately, but he never got to enter in. But that's the thing. Was God wrong to do that or was he right? Well, it's the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Romans, so if you want to turn to Romans chapter 9... I'll read to you from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. See, that's why we can have confidence in the Lord, whether we're going through tribulation or persecution. You know, he promised that all those things, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but that all things will work together for good to them that love God. You know, and while I know everyone is going through their own problems, everyone's got, you know, some people have health issues, some people have financial issues, whatever issues you've got, 
It's like we know that the Lord is going to make it all good in the end. So we can trust in that, and that's why we don't have to worry about it. But we're also going to suffer persecution, because everyone who's in this church who's serving God is going to suffer persecution. It's something that's promised to every one of us. But it's not up to us to question him in anything, whether he's right, righteously judging us or someone we know, someone from our church or, you know, he's judging anyone. You know, we're just to trust in the Lord. So in Romans 9 verse 9, it says, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but then when Rebekah also, also have conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now this is not referring to the people, but it's referring to the nations. It's not Esau that was hated, but it was Edom, the nation that Esau, um, the nation from Esau that they're referring to here. But even still, the Lord chooses who he loves and who he hates. He chooses who, you know, who his children are because they're the ones who believe on his son. And he chooses who the reprobates are, the ones who reject his son. You know, God chooses who he loves and hates because God does hate. You know, he says, I, like so many things you can read through the book of Proverbs, like God hates, you know, pride and arrogancy and a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, like God hates. And he doesn't hate the sin, he hates the person the person committing the sin. See, and it's always done, you know, to show... Sorry, no, I skipped ahead there. But yeah, God chooses who are his people and who are not his people because his people are those who believe on his son, those who choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he chooses who becomes his children. And you may not think that that's right because why can't it be some other way? Well, God is right. And you're wrong. And, you know, it's the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. He thought it was good to do that. Therefore, it's good to do that. And you see, God, those who hate the Lord, the Lord will reject. They can't be saved because they can't believe, which is the one condition of salvation. So I'll continue in verse 14 in Romans 9. It says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So God chooses when he wants to show mercy and when he doesn't. He chooses who he's merciful to and who he's not. He doesn't have to show you mercy. He doesn't have to show you grace. You know, he doesn't have to love you. You know, he can choose to hate you if you reject his son. You know, he can, he can choose not to show mercy at times where you might even want mercy. It's up to God. And sometimes, like when we're being chastised, we'll cry out to God for mercy. Sometimes he'll be merciful to us. Sometimes we go through our punishment and we just take our lumps like a man. And you just have to, because the Lord's right. Whatever he's doing, he knows better than us. We just have to trust in that. You know, he's going to... uh, And that that was referring, of course, in... uh, Sorry, did I get to there? No, I didn't. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, verse 17, Romans 9... Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared through all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he'll have mercy, and whom he will, that's who he wants to, he hardeneth. See, that's referring to Pharaoh in Exodus, where he hardened his heart against God, you know, to not let the people go. So God hardened his heart further to destroy him. It was God's choice to do that. And again, we need to look at those stories through that statement that the Lord is always right, and it's the Lord, let him do what seemed with him good. It was done to show the world that the Lord is not to be messed with, to bring the fear of the Lord upon the people, that he's all-powerful, and that the children of God are also not to be messed with. See, he'll lovingly protect you know, us against even the most power, powerful and the wicked leaders of this world. And that's, again, that's a comfort we can take as his children. Romans 9.19 Thou wilt say it then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to the thing that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? 
Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honour and another unto dishonour? So again, who are you to reply against God? Who are you to question why he does something the way he does it? Like, he created us. We don't have any right to answer back to God. He's the one who formed us. He created us. He made us. And even made this rock we live on called earth. He made everything in it. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and word was God. He created all things through the word of God. It says there was not anything made that was not made except by his hands. And I like the, the potter is a, is a perfect illustration because if you decide that I'm, I've got a piece of clay here and I want to make a bowl, you don't sit there and ask the clay, do, do you want to be a bowl? Do you want to be a cup? You know, what do you want to be? You just decide that I'm going to sit down and I'm going to make a bowl. You have that power. Well, that's God has that power with us. He decided to make you the way you are. So who are you to question, why did, it, why did you make me thus? It's not up to us. You know, he knows what's right and good because he can only do that which is right and good. In him is light and no darkness at all. So we can fully trust in what he does. And even his chastisement is good for us. So we're all familiar with Hebrews 12. You can turn there if you like. But Hebrews 12 verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye bastards and not sons. Now, I'd rather be a son of God and receive a licking every now and again than to be a bastard and be going to hell. You know, given the option, that's a better option. But God's right to chasten us. You know, in, in verse 9 it explains why. It says, Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Again, we should be reverencing God. Which Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. See, God doesn't punish us for his benefit. He gets nothing out of it except a more holy son. You know, he does it for our benefit. It's for us. That's the reason why we're chastened to the Lord, why he puts us through trials and tribulations and persecutions. It's so that we can partake of his holiness. Because there's always a good reason why God does something. Whether we understand why or not, we just need to understand that he knows all things. He's not taken by surprise when bad things happen to you. He's allowed it to happen. It's happening for a reason, and he wants to see how you respond. And as we, as we read before, all things work together for good to, the, to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. It's not our own purpose that we worry about. It's not about getting that new boat, getting that home. You know, as we saw in James, it's not about living for tomorrow. It's about living for today and doing what the Lord wills. So yeah, even, even as the Lord Jesus Christ himself humbled himself to the Father and said, not my will, but thine be done. Of course, referring to the will of the Father that he would have to die on the cross, go to hell and pay for the sins of the whole world through that great sacrifice he made that no one could ever make. Romans 9.22 says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. So I know a lot of you guys are going soul winning. You hear this a lot as well as I do. Some people ask, why is evil allowed to prosper in the world? You know, why aren't reprobates just killed the moment that they are rejected by God? You know, it's too late for them at that point. But God has his purpose even for them. You know, it's so that he can show his destruction, he can show his judgment, and we exist, of course, so he can show his mercy and he can show his grace. In Romans 2, verse 5, it says, But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and impartiality, eternal life 
But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. See, the Lord's to be feared. You know, it says, uh, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. We don't have to worry about avenging ourselves to our enemies because we know that the evil in this world is going to be punished. Every man will pay for what they did in this body. Now for us, we're not going to pay for the sins in this body. They're already paid for. We're going to be rewarded according to the works we do in this body. But the evil, they're going to pay for every bad thing they've ever done. And they will be cast into the lake of fire. Sorry, excuse me. But that's the point. There's, uh, you know, the Lord is to be feared. And we can see the time, the time of that judgment is quickly coming as well. You know, the Lord's timing, it's always in his timing. He knows when's, when's the right time that he will receive the most glory for what he does. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 10, and uh, after that we'll be back in 1 Samuel chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. So it was an admonition for them as well as for us. See, the Lord killed 23,000 people in one day for fornication and idolatry. And that was when Moses came down the mount, having spoken with God. That's what he comes down to find. And then again, when the Lord set up the serpent, that whosoever would look on it shall live. Many died who would not look upon the serpent, you know. All they had to do was just look, look and live. Just look to, the, look to the serpent, look to Christ and live. Because that was a picture of Christ on the cross. And that's why we've got that wonderful hymn. I love that hymn, Look and Live. You know, look and live, you know, it's what saves us, is looking to Christ and what he did on the cross, trusting in him for salvation. But God does these things so people will fear him because we are to fear nothing but God himself. And it's one of the most prevalent commandments in the, in the Bible is to fear God. You'll find it more times than just about anything else. So if you're in, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 6, if you're there as well. Because um, we're going to look at a story now where 50,000 men are killed. In 1 Samuel 6, 1, it says, And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, If you send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then, shall, then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said, said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden emeralds. Five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all, and on your, on your lords. Wherefore you shall make images of your emeralds, and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you, from off your gods, and from off your land. Wherefore then do you harden your heart, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh harden their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let their people... Did they not let the people go and they departed? So we all know what happened in Egypt when the Lord took his people out. 
But we see even hundreds of years later, they're still talking about the story of Pharaoh letting the people go. Because that was a big, a big example. And even the enemies of God know the story. See, Psalms were written about being taken out of Egypt so that the Israelites wouldn't forget what happened. And when God wants to set an example, he makes sure it sticks in people's minds. Like, every, people still talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? That was like 5,000 years ago. But because it sticks in your mind. It's a story that, it's an example that has existed since the beginning of time. God sets it early and says, don't forget. And then you've got other stories through uh, about the Benjamites, you know, and in Judges and, and all of that, where you see similar stories. Same thing happening and God pouring out his judgment on them. But it's about making sure that people remember to fear the Lord. That's the important thing. That's why he does what he does. In 1 Samuel 6, 7, they said, then, Now therefore make a new cart and take two milch kine on which there has come no yoke. Tie the kine to the cart and bring the calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart. And put the jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. So again, we see the wisdom of this heathen nation. Their idea of, of an offering was to offer idols unto the Lord. You know, the idols of, of their emeralds, which, you know, was the plague that was upon them, as well as the mice, like, you know, two things God commanded not to make images of. Um... But the Lord had also commanded the ark not to be carried in that manner. And David also made that same mistake later on. We're going to look at that in a second. But by putting it on a cart, see, it led to the death of Uzzah as well as these 50,000 men. See, there was a specific way that the ark was meant to be carried. And the Bible says the way that it was meant to be carried um, was uh, Exodus 25:13, and thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold and they shall put the staves into the rings by the side of the ark and the ark may be borne with them the staves shall be in the rings of the ark and shall not be taken from it and thou shalt put into the ark of the testimony which I shall give thee and of course it was meant to be carried by the Levitical priests um, were the ones the Levites were the ones who were allowed to carry as well but it was not to be just thrown onto the back of a, a cart with a, an ox in front because we see how badly that ends. So it's not even just the why, but the how. The Lord does things his way. And if he commands you to do something a certain way, then you do it the way he commanded you because that's the right way to do it. It's led to the deaths of people when they don't do it the way the Lord said to do it. Because you just don't know what's going to happen. You're in the Lord's hands at that point. And he's right to do whatever he wills with you. But what we see always happens, though, is the fear of God comes upon whosoever he judges, which is why he judges the way he does. We see 1 Samuel 6, 9. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own curse to Beth Shemesh. Then hath he done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. So they're trying to say that that plague that happened to us, it was just an accident. You know, we want to find out if it was God or not. If we return to God and, and nothing happens, then we know that it wasn't him. It was somebody else. You know, it just, it just happened. A coincidence. But there are no coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences at all. You know, everything happens for a reason. And sometimes God is behind that reason. Uh, in verse 11, And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold, the images of, of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the path, the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. They lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone, and they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kine a burnt offering unto the Lord. So because they're being judged, they're trying to offer this peace offering to the Lord. So even God's judgment brings, you know, brings the fear even on the ungodly and the unbelieving. And that's by design, because perhaps they'll fear the Lord and get saved as a result, you know. In which case, he can send a prophet to teach them how. Uh, 
Uh, we'll skip down to verse 18, 1 Samuel 6, 18. It says, And the golden mice, according to the number of the cities of the Philistines, belong, belonging to the five lords, both of fenced cities and of country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the best she might. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and three score and ten men. That's 50,000 and seventy men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? So you see the reasons for the, the Lord doing this is there in verse 20. He caused the men of Beth Shemesh, the ones who observed this judgment, to turn around and say, you know what, who's able to stand before the Lord? He's too powerful for us. Our God's not like his God. You know, our rock is not like his rock, like their rock. You know, they can see the difference. And it caused the men of Beth Shemesh, you know, to fear the Lord God. So maybe they'll think twice now before making enemies of the Lord and his people. You know, and that's something missing from the world today. It's a lack of fear of the Lord, and there's no respect for God's people. Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. So you, see, you know, It's a very similar statement again. Our God's in heaven, and he's done whatever he pleased. See, God doesn't do things that satisfy the curiosity of the world. They wonder, where is our God? You know, why hasn't he returned from us? You know, why does evil exist in the world? Why are children killed, babies murdered in their mother's wombs? You know, why are people hungry and oppressed by the wicked rulers of this world, the kings and priests uh, and princes, the, you know, the prime ministers and premiers that we deal with? You know, one thing I hear is, why does he sit back and do nothing? You know, but what does the Bible say? It says, our God's in the heaven, and he's done whatsoever he hath pleased. God does, what, you know, what he believes is right, and God is always right. See, we trust and live by faith. We believe that God will always work out his will. It's all for his purpose. If we're martyred, it's for his purpose. You know, if we're saved from persecution and death, it's for his purpose. If we're being tested and tried, it's for his purpose. And also so that we can partake of his holiness, because that's another purpose of God, the purpose he has for us. See, no matter what you're going through right now, the Lord knows, and it's for his purpose. Again, as I said, I don't believe in coincidences. The Lord does things for a reason. We may not understand it, but we just accept it. And, you know, the Lord does what seemeth him good. I'm not saying not to speak to God, like you should fear God so much that you can't even go to him. In fact, we're to boldly go into the throne of grace and we can speak and petition with the king of this universe, you know, the king of all things, and we cry, Abba, Father, because we're children of God. So you shouldn't fear God to the point where you can't even go to him. Because that's an important relationship to have. But what the sermon's about is, you know, just remembering that God is to be feared, God is to be reverenced, and we should all have a healthy fear of the Lord our God. You know, if you find you have an over-familiarity, you know, maybe you begin taking it for granted or, you know, things like that, um, just remember who he is, that he is to be reverenced and worshipped, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Uh, which is actually, in a, that's, that statement is actually made to believers, not to the unbelievers. It's a fearful thing for believers, the children of God, to fall into the hands of the living God. But as I mentioned uh, before, Uzzah, in Second Samuel 6, he was killed for touching the ark. It says, And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, 
and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come unto me? So you see here, God's judgment was swift on Uzzah, but it had the desired effect. See, David feared the Lord from that point on. See, he, after seeing that quick and righteous judgment, David was full of fear of the Lord. And you may be like David initially was and not agree, you know, that God put a breach against Uzzah. But God was right to do that and David was wrong. And we need to understand that. You know, we are to fear God. We are to trust in him. So to live by faith, also not just to trust in his promises, but also to trust in his judgment. Job 13, 15, if anyone had a right to complain, it was Job. And yet this famous verse from Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I'll maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. So if you trust God only when he's doing you good, you're a hypocrite. You've got to trust God when he's doing you good and when he's doing you evil. You know, when bad things are happening to you, you've got to trust in the Lord and look to him, you know, and reverence him and worship him and just believe that God's going to work it all out for good as he promised he did. So we can't just take the good promises, we've got to take the good and the bad as well. You know, when we mess up, he's going to chasten us. We've got to just take it and take it well which is easier said than done. It's something I struggle with myself. But, you know, we, we just have to, to understand that the Lord knows all things and he knows what's good for us. See, I trust in the Lord with my life and my death. So I already trusted him for my salvation. So I'm relying on him to give me those promises that he's coming. You know, the new heaven, the new earth, the new body, you know, being able to live perfectly without this sinful flesh, being rid of this body of death. But, see, that's the thing. I live while he allows me to live. And I'll depart when he wants me to depart. I don't fear what man can do to me, but I fear what the Lord can do to me. And that's why I mentioned before Hebrews 10.30. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, that statement is about us. It's about his people. He's going to judge his people. And we should also be fearful of the Lord. You know, when the Lord tells you to cast certain people out of church because they're idolaters, fornicators, or any other reason, and there are many reasons brought up in those letters to the churches that instruct pastors in matters of church discipline, you know, those judgments are right. We shouldn't question whether they're right. We should respond rather, it's the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Matthew 10, 27 says, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, we know the Lord's not willing that any should perish. But he wants all to come to repentance. But what it says in John six thirty six says, But I said unto you, that ye have also seen me and believe not, all that the Father hath given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So that's our promise, you know, that we've come to the Lord and he's not going to cast us out. We're his forever. It says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of them that he hath given me I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. Again, that's the promise we're counting on. It says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So again, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. But then we look at Luke, 20, uh, Luke 13, as well as in the other Gospels that speaks to this. Those who seek to enter in, but they cannot. It says in Luke 13, 23, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. So while the Lord is willing that all be saved, that all will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and believe, the reality is that most are going to burn. Most are not going to enter in at that straight gate. Most are going to go to hell. They'll be in that lake of fire for eternity. But the Bible says they're without excuse. You know, even nature itself reveals the Godhead. 
So again, is God not justified to cast those who die not believing into the lake of fire? Absolutely he is. You know, yes, that was created for the devil and for his angels. But that's what God chooses to do. If you want to be a child of God, you believe on his son. And everyone is without excuse. But, you know, if you, if you die and you haven't believed on the son, which is where most people are going to go, you know, again, it's hard for us to swallow. It's hard for us to accept that just so many people are going to burn forever and eternity. But that's what God chose to do. And God is right to do that. It's the Lord. Let him do what seemeth with him good. But we should fear the Lord and the world should fear the Lord. So our preaching can also instill the fear of God into them, just like Christ, you know, just like God did with his examples. So we all know that verse in Jude 122. And some having compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So again, that's why we've been given the gospel, you know, to be able to preach to people, to show them how they can be saved. You know, if they want to pull themselves out of the fire, we teach, we teach them how. We tell them this is how you get out of the fire. But by default, everyone's going into that fire. And that's most people. Because broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. And there, there are few that be saved. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of, your, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So that's important for us. So firstly, we don't change our message because we fear men. So we stand before the kings of this world, we rebuke the wickedness, and we preach God's holiness without compromise. See, John the Baptist did this exact thing, and he lost his life. But he did gain a crown in heaven. And of course, it's all written about in the Gospels, so we can read about, you know, John's sacrifice as well, how he was martyred for the Lord, for preaching what was true. See, the Lord did what seemeth him good, even to John's death. But we preach the same Gospel, as divisive as it is, because it's the truth, and the truth is everything. You know, others' eternal lives depend on us having the boldness to not cower in fear to men, but to stand strong in the spirit of God unwavering. So where you've got all these cowardly pastors who change their gospel because they, you know, their friends teach it works gospel or whatever and they don't want to be clear on it or they don't want to lose their, their church members because if they preach too clear, clearly on the gospel or on, you know, against like pre-trib rapture or anything like that, they might lose people or lose friends. It's like God doesn't have time for cowards. God wants you to stand strong in the word of God and preach the truth unwavering especially when it comes to the gospel. But that second part of Matthew, uh, was it Matthew, t Matthew 10, verse 29, you know, that's comforting for us as his children. The Lord God our Father knows every hair of our head, so he's able to both destroy and to save our life. We're completely in his hands. He controls our breath. So if we're in tough times, he can provide. How many times in the Old Testament, even the New Testament, do you see stories of people who are hard done by, who are going through famine or something like that, and the Lord just provides for them? You know, you've got widows and things like that. You've got the stories in the Book of Ruth. You know, you've got stories in the... Um, but I think it was Elisha went to, like, a Syrian woman or something, and, you know, a Syrian widow, and was basically able to... The oil that never ran out, like, God can provide. He provided for them in the wilderness... You know, he can provide for us, so we don't have to worry. We can, we can trust God in those tough times. But he will allow us to go through tribulation and persecution for our own good. Sometimes we'll be spared from it, sometimes we won't. But that's up to the whim of the Lord. That's his doing. We don't question it. So I'll leave. So we'll just go back to uh, Jeremiah 33, where we got the reading from today. Verse 9. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 9. It says, Then it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honour before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, 
and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for the prosperity that I procure unto it. So this has been a pretty negative sermon. We've been looking at a lot of the, a lot of the evil or a lot of the judgments brought upon men. But see, even the good things that God does for us can cause the people to fear the Lord. Because they can see the prosperity of a nation like Israel, where in Egypt it brought fear upon the Pharaoh because he's like, they're multiplying quicker than we are. That soon they're going to be a greater nation than us. You know, that brought the fear of God onto Pharaoh. It's like, even the good things God does. So we should also be quick to praise him as well and to boast in the Lord to other people about how great the Lord is, that they would also fear him for the good that he does. But whether he does good or evil, this is what I want people to remember, that statement, it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. 